Good afternoon. I hope you had a good meal. Turn this off. So, with a very short preamble this afternoon, I'd like to go quite quickly to meditation. And linking this to the topics discussed earlier this morning, the issue of hedonia always being stimulus-driven. Of course, the stimulus could be a drug on your brain. It could be alcohol. It could be nicotine. It could be. It doesn't have to come this way. It can come through the back door. So that's quite clear. If you get, if you enjoy getting drunk, that's hedonia, not because you saw something or even tasted something that was pleasant, but you, you know, get the pleasant from the stimulation on your brain. Um, but as you'll see, I think in the a discussion, because I spoke with Eva about what she'll be sharing. I listened to her, and she'll t she told, told me what I'd like to share. I think you'll be going into that more deeply this afternoon. It should be quite interesting, especially when we speak of stimulus-driven pleasure within a spiritual context, through ritual, through me active meditations, through recitation, through liturgies, and so forth, that it just gets very interesting. And I won't elaborate on that, because I'm sure that Eva will have some very interesting things to say. There's a lot of nuance there. At the same time, I would say, not all stimulus-driven pleasure or pleasure that arises in response to stimulus is hedonia, but all hedonia is stimulus-driven pleasure. And I think, especially those of us who've been around for several decades, we're aware that the dependence on stimulation, the overstimulation of my generation, the next one, and the next one down, is, is getting ramped up. Just more intense stimulation, more and more, more intense, and more and more dependence upon, and I think it, one, one could literally say, addiction to stimulation. That if you're, not, if you're not being stimulated by something, then you just don't know what to do. In fact, I will give a short account of a scientific study that was done, because it's just leaping to mind, and it's pretty interesting. It was about 10 years ago or so, it was in America, and they had a group of, it was very, very well designed scientific study with men and women. They did all the, you know, the demographics. And the very simple task they gave to these subjects, half men, half women, was you would get to sit in a room by yourself with no stimulation at all. You're not hungry, it's not hot, it's not cold, you're just sitting there in a chair for 15 minutes, and there's just nothing to do. For many things, there's, there's nothing, it's just you're in a room, and except for one thing you can do, and that is right next to your chair, there's a little device that can give you an electric shock basically an electric socket, but not kill you, but you get, a, you get a jolt. So you've got a choice there for those 15 minutes. You can just sit there and mind your own business and not do anything for 15 minutes, or uh, you can anytime you wish, and as often as you wish, you can stick your finger in an electric socket. <laughs> 15 minutes. And so they ran the study, and they found that two-thirds of the men would go for the socket. And the outlier, the outlier did it 180 times in 15 minutes. But two-thirds of the men couldn't get through 15 minutes of lack of stimulation, even a very clearly unpleasant one. The women, and I think this is a very strong indication that we should have more women in, in positions of influence and power, 25%. So two-thirds of the men and 25% of the women would go for the socket. They preferred that to having to be with their minds, with no buffer, no media, no, no protection from mind. So that is a commentary not on those, on those men and women, but it's a commentary on the addiction to stimuli in the modern world. And the underlying, I think the underlying resources is, if I'm not being stimulated, I have no resources of my own at all to find happiness. I'm, I'm just nothing. I got nothing. And the only way I get any, any, any kind of pleasure at all or have my, have my interest aroused is from stimulation. And so Blaise Pascal, just before I came, came here, I was looking for the wonderful quote, but Blaise Pascal, the great Christian theologian and mathematician and philosopher, heavy duty, 17th century, I believe, maybe early 18th. But I can only paraphrase him. I wish I'd found it, but it's OK. The gist of it was he's writing roughly 300 years ago, and he said the, prob the problem with modern man, and he said in the court, in business, in every aspect of modern society, is that gives rise to all manner of strife and conflict is one boils down to one simple thing, the inability of man to sit quietly in his chambers. And that was 300 years ago. So I think this is really good food for thought. 
And so as we are now, just now within moments, when we go to our first practice, and there will be three, that will really spend our leisure going to, into theory and practice, mindfulness of breathing with variations, the shamatha practice of observing the mind, we'll have a lot of elaboration on that, and the ever so simple, the simplest of all shamatha practices within Buddhism and probably anywhere, is simply resting in the awareness of being aware. That's about as stimulus-free as you can get. Um, but each of these three, and there are literally dozens and dozens of methods of shamatha, methods for developing your attention skills within Buddhism, let alone in the early Christian tradition, the Hindu tradition is immensely rich, and so on. Just in the Buddhist tradition, the Buddha taught 40 different methods. And that's only in the Pali Canon, that's not Mahayana or Vajrayana. But the Buddha did say, for the people in his time, living roughly 2,600 years ago, he, he pointed out different personality types, psychophysiological constitutions. Some people are very prone to anger, more hot-tempered. Some are more towards greed and lust. Some towards arrogance, some towards delusion. And some, one personality type in rural India 2,600 years ago, is some people are very prone to rumination. Their minds just won't stop talking, blah, 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 blah. Even when there's nothing to think about, they just kind of like a drippy faucet or faucet you just can't turn off, the mind just keeps on having, pardon me, diarrhea of the mind. It just can't stop running. And he said, there are people like that. In India, 2,600 years ago, those people, you know, over there in the corner there, though, not you, but to the, to, the, to the left of you, those people, they, for all of the methods of shamatha that I'm teaching, said the Buddha, the only one that's good for those people is mindfulness of breathing. The other ones will probably make you uptight, tie you up in knots. But mindfulness of breathing is soothing, it's calming, it's gentle. Very briefly, the two ways is of breaking a horse or training a horse. One is breaking the horse with your spurs and all that business. You'd be aikaiye and the horse is freaking out, trying to kick you off because you're terrifying it. But you can break a horse that way. And then if you watch movies or read books at all, the horse whisper. The other way is to whisper the horse, to gentle the horse, to love the horse, be loved by the horse. And you never break the horse, you be, be, befriend the horse. So there we it is. So I'm suggesting here, in mindfulness of breathing, you're being a horse whisper and not breaking the back of your mind. You're gentling your mind. You're soothing your mind. Like a child who's just suddenly been startled and is, is crying and just terrified. Some, it was a loud bang or something suddenly, and the child is like that. Well, you could spank the child. You could shout at the child to be quiet. You could shake the child until the child... Or maybe you could just gentle the child. You could hold the child. We should be gentle to our minds. They're like a child. They're like a wild horse. On robust days, they're like a wild, untamed elephant. There is no more destructive force in human society than the human mind. Much more destructive than A-bombs, atom bombs, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, because it's the mind that created all of those. The mind is the most powerful, most dangerous weapon on the planet. And it's also the most magnificent. The great acts of benevolence, philanthropy, art, science, creativity, literature, and so forth. So the mind can be our best friend. It can be the best friend of all of humanity, the best friend for all of our fellow citizens, all of our fellow p creatures on this planet. It can be the greatest friend, and it can be the worst diabolical enemy that will destroy the planet and undermine human civilization. It all goes down to the mind. And so to gentle, to tame the mind, I'll just give you a Tibetan transmission. You just got it in Tibetan. The quintessence of all the teachings of the Buddha is avoid evil, harmful activity altogether. Stop. Engage in a bounty of virtue. Be a virtuous person. Manifest virtue. Do a bounty. Completely subdue your mind. Train your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. I just gave the whole teaching of the Buddha. Everything else is commentary on that. But how do you subdue your mind? Do you whip it into shape? Do you beat it with asceticism, with strenuous activities that punishing your mind into submission? Or do you gentle it? So I'm about to finish here. This mindfulness of breathing is gentle. It's soothing. It's calming. It's for people, that little minority back in classical India 2,600 years ago, and modernity kind of everywhere, you know, to take this mind that is so hmm, turbulent, active, agitated, never at peace, and soothe it, calm it, 
So it comes to stillness, not because you've clamped down on it, but because you've released that which antates the mind. So it's mindfulness of breathing. The final point before I start. We're attending to something. We're attending to the sensations of the body breathing. We're attending to the rise and fall of the abdomen. Or we're attending to the sensations of the breath right at the apertures of the nostrils. We're attending to something. But what we're attending to in each of these cases is not pleasant, like lovely incense, or tasty food, or nice music, or a very lovely touch, a soft touch of something. It's neutral. The sensations of breathing are not pleasant, like you want to hyperventilate so you get more, nor are they unpleasant, you want to hold your breath. They're really quite neutral. It's kind of like, I think this, let's try it. Oh, that's a little bit pleasant, because it, it's the sparkling water. If it were flat, it would be even better. But I like sparkling water, so they gave me a little bit of stimulation there. <laughs> the, you know, they really so pamper me whenever I travel. You want sparkling water? We'll give you sparkling water. Okay. But flat water, room temperature water on a hot day, it's okay. But I'm not going to drink so much of it because I like it so much. Right? And so the sensations of breathing, the experience of breathing, is not unpleasant, if not unpleasant. We're attending to it, but you're not going to get any hedonic pleasure. Not likely. Hedonic pleasure from the experiencing breathing, not likely. And very specifically, that is chosen, that when we engage in this practice for 24 minutes, or maybe you can take a day off, like devout Christians do, Jews and Muslims, maybe one day off, what would happen? Would the world stop? If one day a week you didn't work and you really took a Buddhist Sabbath, a Hindu Sabbath, and so forth, and you just had one day for Dharma, and you made that regular. I wonder if, if the GDP of, of Australia would just go down the tubes if that happened. Oh, no, they took a day off, you know? But that was normal for most of Western civilization, for most of its history. Now, in America, Sabbath is mostly for football, as I recall. Um, but a day of rest a day of rest. How about Sabbath be a day of cultivation of eudaimonia? Just one day, only devoted to that. And the rest of the days, of course, you have to combine making, living, and so forth with the cultivation of eudaimonia. That when we're practicing mindful breathing, whether for a 24-minute session or a one day per week, or you go for a week-long retreat, or you do a self-retreat, a weekend or longer, or you go off into solitude, you're well prepared, the outer and the inner conditions are all there, and you go off into solitude for a sustained period of time until you achieve shamatha, and I'll get to that later. Any of these variations. When you're doing that, you're going to a retreat center, all there is to do there is meditate, and there's almost no hedoni at all, except for blandly pleasant food and hopefully really nice scenery, and that's about it. As I've done this for years, five years or so plus, living in solitary retreat. Decent food, but it's not that pleasant, otherwise you'll start wanting it a lot, so just pretty ordinary. And it's very nice to have the beauty of nature. That's very nice, but that's about it. And so in that, and then you're doing something like mindfully breathing and mindfully breathing down. And in a six-month retreat I did a few years back, I was, I was doing this practice 12 hours a day. And I can tell you I never got bored. I wasn't bored after 12 hours, I was just kind of sleepy, ready for some bed. And so what this is, this practice, whether 24 minutes or 12 hours a day for six months or going into an open-ended shamatha retreat, you are in a detox program. Hermitages are stimulus addiction rehabilitation centers. Whether Christian monasteries, Buddhists, and so forth, Christian monasteries are not known apart from the beauty of the cathedral, the churches, the beauty of the liturgy, the beauty of ritual. That's definitely there, and it's wonderful but they're not known for being gourmet food and so forth. The monastic way of life is not known for being heavily dependent upon hedonia, stimulus-driven pleasures, so that you can wean yourself off of that and then be relying more and more and more on eudaimonia. So I will wrap up. I said it'd be short. Whenever I say that, by the way, I just give you a heads up. Don't believe me. <laughs> Every time I say it, I mean it, and almost never is it true. So just, you can just kind of plug. He said short. Yeah, he doesn't mean it. Go ahead. Hmm. Yeah. It's a stimulus rehabilitation center, stimulus addiction rehabilitation center. That's what this retreat is, although a lot of stimulation for me, I'm afraid. But going into this practice, you're weaning yourself off stimulation and discovering for yourself, can you have a sense of peace of mind? Can you discover 
a sense of well-being? Can you even discover joy without it being reliant upon the stimulation, even mental? Because this is just flat. This is like flat water. It's just neutral. And so for this practice, it needs to be focusing on something that is just neutral, not feeding your hedonic craving. So let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try it. We're, we're going to be doing this multiple times on variations of the theme. But please find a comfortable position. We'll now go into a 24-minute session. We're starting our shamatha practice in this retreat, in this session. We will begin every session with settling body, speech, and mind in their natural states. I was giving a lot of instruction in the first session. Less this time, less the next time, until I have the confidence you've got the hang of it. Then I'll simply say, now, settle body, speech, and mind in their natural states as you've done before. But for those who've not received this instruction before, I will give now a refresher course, but with fewer words. And then we'll go to the main practice. You hear the sound of the chime, relax. Let your awareness descend right down to the floor, your chair, whatever is supporting you. Let your awareness descend to the ground. Let your conceptual mind melt, dissolve into a simple flow of non-conceptual awareness that is still clear and discerning, but simply not snagged or caught up in the network of thoughts and language. Begin to cultivate a flow of knowing, clear and discerning, intelligent, knowing, without that knowing being embedded in thought or language. And once you've settled your awareness in that field of sensations of the earth element, solidity and firmness, Again, like a fragrance filling a room, let your awareness fill the entire somatic space of your body, mindfully aware of the whole range of sensations arising within this field. Wherever there's firmness, a sense of solidity, you're sensing the sensations of the earth element. Wherever there's fluid, fluidity, the, the moisture in your mouth, for example, the water element. There's a gradient from cold to hot, corresponding to the intensity of the fire element. There's all types of sensations of motion, whether vibration, movement of the breath, movement of limbs, any sense of movement, fluctuations, vibrations within the body, air element. Be aware of the whole range of tactile sensations arising within the field of your body, and simply witness them without commentary, words, or visualization. And set your body at ease. 
If you sense areas that feel tight, your shoulders, face, or elsewhere. As you breathe in, gently focus your attention on those areas that feel tight. Gently, gently. And as you breathe out, surrender your muscles to gravity as if with a sigh of relief. With every breath, Cultivating the sense of ease and comfort of relaxation, the sense of stillness of your body, the vigilance, the alertness of your posture, even while lying down. Your body is utterly relaxed, but psychologically, you've adopted this position, this shavasana, this corpse, this corpse position, as a posture of formal practice. So mentally, you are vigilant. And physically, you're utterly relaxed. <coughs> Settle your body in a state of ease, stillness, and vigilance. Then settle your respiration in its natural flow. And you will find this is very subtle. Because generally when we attend to something very closely that we can influence, we do overcome that tendency and simply witness the breath flowing in, the breath flowing out, observing the flow of the respiration egolessly, relinquishing all control, all influence and allow your body to breathe as if you weren't there, as if you were deep asleep. And with every out breath, relax the body, release the breath all the way to the end and release any thoughts or images that may come to mind. Return to silence with every exhalation. this way, settle your speech, especially the inner speech, the voice of the mind, in effortless silence. you attend to this more and more closely, you will see how subtle it is, how easily your desire, expectation, preference will filter in, and you'll find you are modifying the breath. See if you can release that tendency, as if you are having an out-of-body experience witnessing somebody else's body breathe. subtle. And then we turn to the subtlest of these three settlings of the mind. As we settle the mind in a sense of ease, relaxation, comfort. It's not an on-off switch. It is a gradient of a deeper and deeper sense of ease, the sense of being carefree, fearless, go deep and go deeper. If you are a Buddhist, taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha, and experience that sense of ease, that joyful surrender. as you devote yourself to Dharma, passionately, but with such a sense of ease, and 
freedom from anxiety, freedom from hope and fear. Relax. And in that release of all desires and dislikes, that release of all grasping, awareness naturally settles in stillness. You're not making it still. Still is what manifests to you. When you stop agitating the, your awareness, tying it up in knots, with all your hopes and fears, desires and aversions, all the flow of rumination, when you give all of that a rest, awareness is naturally still, effortlessly still. experience of clarity, of wakefulness, of vigilance, of alertness is not something you add to awareness by striving. It's the very nature of awareness. When it's unveiled from grasping, so rest there in the effort, effortless sense of ease and stillness and clarity of awareness. Come home, rest, awareness in its natural state. Bright and clear, discerning and intelligent, but simple, unelaborated. Rest in that flow of awareness of being aware. Noticing the activities of the mind, but not being carried away by them or identifying with them. In this way, you settle your mind in its natural state. Now for the second half of this 24-minute session called a Gattaka in Sanskrit. For the second half, we turn now to a main practice, a shamatha practice of mindfulness of breathing. And the method we'll adopt now traces back 1,500 years to Asanga, but we go directly to the method itself. And that is from this stillness of awareness. Direct your attention now, if you will, once again to the entire somatic field of your body from the soles of your feet right up to the crown of your head. Be aware of the whole space of tactile sensations and the whole range of sensations arising within this field. Observe the movements of these sensations from the perspective of the stillness of your awareness. Now within that diverse range of tactile sensations, sensations of earth, water, fire, and air, I invite you now to selectively focus your attention on just those sensations throughout the entire body that correlate with the in and outflow of your breath. In other words, focus single-pointedly on the experience of your body breathing. You 
can experience it not only in your belly, your chest, not only at the, nos at the nostrils, you can experience it in your legs, in your limbs. Every sensation of movement within the body It is obviously correlated with in-breath, the out-breath. Focus on all of these fluctuations. One can call them energetic fluctuations throughout the body that are the fluctuations of the in and out breath. It's very easy to add to this practice. Holding some type of mental imagery of what you think your body looks like, or thinking about the body, thinking about the breath. But now, see if you can release all of that, all mental imagery, all thoughts, language, and just focus nakedly, without conceptual elaboration, on the bare tactile sensations throughout the body, of the body breathing in, the body breathing out. Continue throughout the entire session to allow your breath, the flow of respiration, to settle in its natural flow. Sometimes long, sometimes short. Sometimes there may be a pause after the end of exhalation, sometimes not. Whatever it is, let it be. Just observe the rhythm. When the in-breath is long, note that it is long. When the out-breath is long, note that it is long. On occasion, when the in-breath is short, note that it is short. When the out-breath is short, note that it is short. So maintain this very simple but clear flow of cognizance, a flow of knowing the relative duration of each in and out breath. sensations you are attending to are empty of thought and empty of language. There are no words to be found here. So let there be a symmetry of that which you are attending to and that with which you are attending, namely your awareness. Let it too be free of thought and language, but discerningly attend to this flow these fluctuations of energy throughout the body corresponding with the rhythm of the breath. practices of shamatha are exercises in cultivating a sense of inner balance. 
specifically in terms of attention. So in this phase of practice, this mode of mindfulness of breathing, I invite you to take on the cultivation of a very specific type of balance, and that is breath by breath, especially with each exhalation, cultivate a deeper and deeper sense of ease, of relaxation, of letting go, of joyful surrender. Even perhaps surrendering your sense of your own identity, so carefree. With each breath, especially every exhalation, relax more and more deeply, but without losing the sense of clarity, clarity of attention with which you began the session. So generally when we relax more and more deeply, we immediately start losing the clarity, the mind becomes dull, the mind becomes spaced out, the mind gets sleepy, we go to sleep. Very relaxed, but we sacrifice clarity and slip into dullness and sleep. So the challenge here is to indeed Relax more and more deeply, as if you were falling asleep. But sustain the clarity with which you began. The flow of clear cognizance, wide awake, but more and more deeply relaxed. The bounties of this are great, cultivated. Continue practicing now for the last three minutes or so in silence.
So, let's return back to this enormously important distinction between hedonia, and there are many definitions, I'm sure. I'm just giving one that I think is useful. Hedonia is stimulus-driven pleasure. And eudaimonia, which doesn't need any simulation at all to experience a sense of well-being, peace of mind, even joy itself. And so the Buddha set out those four that should be within, within reach of people living a wholesome, ethical way of life, following a right livelihood, and so forth. This can be your lot. This can be, your life can be actually have a lot of happiness in it. And here are four types of happiness you may very well experience. But then, not just monastics, but people who are really, who may have made their vocation practicing Dharma. I'm actually such a person. Before I became a monk from the age of 20, there's just nothing else I really wanted to do than practice Dharma. I took monastic vows so that I would not be distracted by anything else. That was very good for 14 years. And then I found myself in an environment where I just didn't feel that being a monk was really being a monk like what the Buddha had in mind. It's just so non, no context for it. Formally offered back my precepts and then continued practicing Dharma because there's nothing else I wanted to do. So these are not monastic robes. These are the robes of a Dharma teacher. Um, but I really don't have anything else I really want to do. And so I think I'm a Dharma practitioner. And that's what he's referring to here. For those who are really devoting themselves to Dharma, within monasticism or outside, but for which their spiritual practice is really central to their practice. Not to say they never go out for some hedonia, but for those genuinely dedicated Dharma practitioners, that's what I would say. He said, for you then, then you are very explicitly prioritizing the cultivation of genuine well-being over hedonia. Hedonia is for the sake of cultivating eudaimonia. You eat, you, you clothe yourself, you exercise and so forth in order to practice dharma. And so for such people, then what types of happiness might you expect, anticipate realistically? And the first is exactly common ground with the finest form of happiness that the householder may anticipate. And the Buddha said something like, and I really have no idea why he gave the number, but he said, the sense of happiness that you will experience as a result of blamelessness or having a clear conscience is 16 times greater than any of the earlier three. Don't ask me why. It's symbolic, or he actually checked it up yet, about sometimes 17, sometimes 15, but pretty much 16. I have no idea. But he's making a point here that the satisfaction, the contentment, the sense of fulfillment you will experience by knowing, by living an ethical way of life, which really is nonviolent and benevolent, as the, the, North Star is by, the North Star by which you navigate through your life, your bottom line, your modus operandi, your baseline is come what may, I will be nonviolent, and whenever I have the opportunity to manifest benevolence in this life, I will do so. That the satisfaction you get from that, the sense of well-being, the happiness you get will be more than simply having enough, having some wealth, and having no, no debts. And so, but then we go to those who are full-time Dharma practitioners, and that really could be any of us here. For such pe people, well, three types of well-being, and the first one, lo and behold, it's having a clear conscience, but it's also having contentment. Contentment for the Dharma practitioner, lay or monastic. Contentment is really the hallmark of a very dedicated Dharma practitioner, that they're really content with having just enough. They see the whole point of the, cult, the pursuit of hedonia, the whole point was just to have enough. And then you get on with the main reason to be alive, the purpose of life, to find happiness that the Dalai Lama is referring to and not what Albert Einstein was referring to. And this is universal. Occasionally, just because I did some study here, Thomas Aquinas, the great, brilliant, brilliant theologian and philosopher, said, and I paraphrase him closely, the whole point of the political life is the, the contemplative life. Political life, he's not talking politics, that's just one, he's, I really think he is referring to the, the pursuit of hedonia, success, success in the world. Your business is going well, this is going well, you're successful, you're getting more wealth, greater influence and so forth. The whole point of that, food, clothing, shelter, education, and mental care, medical care. What's the point of all of that? Just so you have that and then now you're supposed to be happy? No, he said, that's, that's the political life doing whatever you need to do to get food, clothing, shelter, medical care, and education. And now that you've got that, now, good, now is where you begin. And when you think of thinking something better in life, don't think of more of the same. 
Think of something qualitatively different. How about eudaimonia? Because that is sustainable and it's not competitive and it will provide you with the ultimate satisfaction. There is no upper limit to that. The whole point of eudaimonia is eudaimonia. It's a Christian truth. It's a Buddhist truth. It's a Hindu truth. That must mean it's probably just true. But if you never know about eudaimonia, and many people don't know the Greek or English or Italian or Sanskrit, they've never even heard of it. They have no idea what it is. They don't even know that such a thing exists. Nobody told them. When they think of something better, they're suffering from what I would call an imagination deficit disorder. Because better is, well, I know it's nice to have one car. I like better. I like a better car, maybe two. And I have a nice house. It's perfectly good enough. But I have enough money and I could buy a nice house. And more of the same. More of the same. And it's exactly that prioritization of hedonia and then the supporting way of life of consumerism by 7.8 billion people growing towards 11 billion, which is maxing out the planet in terms of human population. It's exactly that prioritization that the pursuit of the good life is the pursuit of hedonia, which you get by way of consumerism, that's destroying the planet right now. So the stakes here are very high, and I'm not being melodramatic. We are destroying our planet, and it's because of our fixation on hedonia and consumerism, as better means that. We really have to grow up and restore our humanity and do something pigs can't do, because I think pigs don't really know how to cultivate eudaimonia. And so the stakes here are very high. And in eudaimonia lies the hope of humanity. If we don't wake up, and I'm not saying convert to Buddhism or even become religious, because that's the beauty of eudaimonia. It cuts across all the boundaries. This religion, that religion, no religion, philosophy, no philosophy, science. It's there. It's a ripe fruit waiting to be plucked. And if you want to do the science, OK, the science will give you plenty. You want just philosophy? You don't need to go further than Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. They got plenty for you. And any of the great religions, I think bar none, whether they call it whatever they call it, it's there. Because there is no religion in the world that's all about hedonia. Tell me the religion that's all about hedonia. It's perversions of religion that may turn into something like prosperity Christianity, which is all about prosperity and has nothing to do with Christianity at all. Right? OK, that's a perversion. I'm sorry, but that's my view. You can disagree if you like. I don't care. And so the stakes couldn't be higher. With 7 point billion and counting and wanting better, if the better is always within the notion, within the framework of hedonian consumerism, this planet will not bear the weight. And we are destroying it now. So there's the first one. But contentment, getting to that point where, OK, maybe a little bit of wealth. Well, I could go to stories, but not right now. But having a little bit of extra, OK. A monk got a little bit more than he needs in his alms bowl. He said, oh, want some of mine? OK, sure. That was the monk's act of generosity for the day. That's common ground, but contentment, being satisfied, being utterly content with what you have, knowing it's enough. And now I can get on with the main event of being a human being, being fully human, being transcendently human, and shooting for the sky. Is there any upper limit? of happiness, contentment, and fulfillment. If there is, I want to find it. And if there isn't, I want to know that too. So on that basis, and this is the basis of ethics, and ethics in Buddhism is simple. It's extremely complex, but at root it's simple. It's nonviolence by way of body, speech, and mind. And it is benevolence by way of body, speech, and mind whenever we have the opportunity, and that's it. And everything else is commentary. And that is universal. I see nothing incompatible with Christian morals or Muslim morals. Taoist and so forth, and many secular systems of morality with no, no reference to religion at all. But overall, couldn't we all agree that nonviolence in general, sometimes a necessary evil, we know that's true. Sometimes you have to reprimand your children. You don't always just tell them sweet, cuddly things. Maybe it's just a reprimand. And children don't like that. Their children don't like, who likes to be reprimanded? It's not fun. And so we said, well, that was a bit tough. Did you really have to speak tough? And I did. Johnny just stepped out in front of a car. He didn't look when he's crossing. And I had to catch his attention. Johnny, you must not do that. Johnny doesn't like being talked to that way. But sometimes violence is unnecessary. And almost never is it. But when it is, it is. But our 
our baseline is nonviolence, and our baseline is benevolence. So there's that. That's the first one. And that is very much in our interrelationship with our fellow human beings, fellow sentient beings. And now we really have to say in the 21st century, are the whole ecosphere. Environmental ethics is not just other plants and animals, it's also the soil, the sky, the, the sea, the air, and so forth. It's environmental ethics, and we don't wake up to that, then we will again undermine human civilization within the lifetime of younger people here. Maybe not mine, but not how I've did, not, not long after. Then we'll see just the civilization as we know it is in past tense. And so that's the first one. It's environmental, it's ethical. And there's a tremendous level, very real sense of well being that can arise by being truly ethical and content. And that's interrelational as we, as social creatures. But then one can ask, I think a very deep question, it's simple, and that is, can one be happy in utter solitude? That is, you need food from other people, you need, you need shelter, you probably didn't make it yourself, you didn't make the wood, and so forth. But if you're living alone in solitude, with really almost nothing in the way of hedonic pleasant stimulation, can you, not for 15 minutes, but for a day, for 15 days, for months, can you live in solitude with very, very little in the way of hedonic stimulation? No entertainment. Beauties of nature is good, but beyond that, simple food, and then it's just you and your mind. You and your body and mind. Welcome to reality. Here you are. And you are alone. You will die alone. Get used to it. Can you be happy while you're in solitude? Can you actually be content? Can you experience a flow of well-being from day to day? without falling into the addiction of give me the, give me, I'm an addiction, I'm a stimulus junkie. Where's my fix? Where's my fix? I gotta surf the internet. I gotta send an email. I gotta, gotta, gotta. You're an addict. Can you find a sense of well-being in solitude? Can your own mind in solitude, can that be a source of well-being? I'm not talking about anything religious here, just your mind, your awareness. Can you so cultivate your mind? Cultivate your mind. A good place to start is this retreat. Cultivate your attention and see what you discover. Cultivate insight for applications of mindfulness, for example, and see whether a sense of well-being and even joy comes from insight. What Tom, St. Thomas called the greatest joy is a truth-given joy. He's talking about eudaimonia. The highest level of eudaimonia is truth-given joy. It's true in Buddhism, it's true in Christianity, etc. Dot, dot, dot. But we're not quite there yet. But to prepare your mind, to fertilize and to cultivate, to till the field of your mind, so that when you sow the seeds of wisdom, sow the seeds of loving kindness and compassion, they grow. Or are you sowing these blessed seeds in a toxic field, filled with neuroses and anxiety and low self-esteem, and depression and irritability and so forth. Is that the field you're sowing the seeds of Dharma? In which case, don't expect them to grow very deep roots. And so this second phase is really making of your body mind, but most importantly, making of your mind a suitable vessel for the nectar of Dharma. But the nectar of Dharma, again, your mind like a field, you practice your dharma, whether Christian dharma, Buddhist, or any other kind of dharma, and it goes in, and it goes right down to the roots. And you grow the bountiful field of a mind that is well-tuned, well-balanced, healthy, vigorous, relaxed, still, and clear. A truly, exceptionally healthy and well-balanced mind. And discover for yourself, you know, it's not enough just to believe this, believe anything you like. But to know this through cultivating your mind, this higher training in samadhi, that's what it's called in Buddhism, which is not just concentration, it's cultivating exceptional mental balance, mental health, and as a symptom of that, mental well-being. And that's the second training, and that's a deeper dimension, and you can do that on your own. You need a bit of help from your friends, but it's pretty much just a bit of food and clothing and shelter. It's really very little. I've lived for five years in solitude. You need very little. $10 a day, if you don't have to pay rent, $10 a day, easy peasy. You got it. You really, ah. First long retreat I did, 1980, a friend of mine once a week brought me some food. I had a little kerosene stove. That was it. You know, 
That was, that was not $10 a day. Oh, maybe $2 a day in India. No problem. No problem. And so to be able to so cultivate your mind. As one friend of mine who did a nine-month retreat, and he was a seasoned practitioner. He's not going into a nine-month retreat as a, a neophyte. But when he came out of his nine-month retreat, in solitude, hardly seeing anybody at all, but plenty of beauty of, beauty of the environment. He was living in a gorgeous place, a uh, mountainous area, beautiful. But that was it. That, his, his only was looking out the window, you know. Oh, it's gorgeous. But besides that, inside his hut, it's really just basic Neanderthal, simple, nothing there. He said, a bit of food, not too cold, not too hot. And he came out, and I asked him, um, how is your retreat? And I can't quite show his expression, but beautific, isn't that a word? He, he turned to me and said, it was a river of gold. OK, that's a practitioner of Dharma. It's not because he was a Buddhist or a Christian or a Hindu. He was practicing Dharma, and he cultivated his mind that he would not be looking for something else out there that would make him happy. Because he had found that sense of peace of mind, a river of gold pretty well tells it all, through cultivating his mind, and his mind was his best friend, his closest neighbor. That's what the Buddha is referring to here. We're not yet into the realm of religion. It's not religious. It's, it's really wise psychology. It's depth psychology to discover for yourself that your own mind can be, indeed, an artesian well of happiness. An artesian well is every time you go to the well, you get water. And for as long as you stay, you get more water. You find the artesian well of happiness, and every time you go there, you find happiness. And the longer you stay, you find more happiness. It exists. But if you just believe it, it's like believing there's really good food someplace, but starving to death in the meantime. Not enough to believe it. You have to find you have to find the food. That's the second one, and the third one here in this classic trilogy of the three higher trainings of ethics: samadhi, samadhi being a unification, a balance, a refinement, an accentuation of mental balance and health, and the well-being that ensues from that psychological eudaimonia. Now you're really ready to practice deep dharma. In the Buddhist tradition, vipassana. The wisdom teachings, Vipassana teachings, Vajrayana teachings, stage regeneration, stage of completion, Mahamudra Dzogchen. Oh, you are now ready. We have the ambrosia. We can pour it into your mind, and that, that ambrosia will go right in. It will nurture your roots. But if you're bringing a neurotic mind to Vipassana, you're going to be a neurotic Vipassana practitioner. If you bring it to Vajrayana, you'll probably be an exceptionally neurotic Vajrayana practitioner. And if you bring it to Dzogchen, you're going to be cuckoo, cuckoo. You'll miss it entirely. You won't even know this fragrance of Dzogchen because you're so wrapped up in your neuroses. So actually, mental health and balance is a prerequisite for deep contemplative practice. And deep contemplative practice is no substitute for developing exceptional mental health and balance. And that's what this middle training is, to make of your mind a suitable vessel for then go for the higher training in wisdom. And it is. It is wisdom that liberates. This is not only Buddhist assertion. It is ignorance and delusion that plunge us into suffering and perpetuate our suffering. And there's only one antidote for ignorance and delusion, not knowing the nature of reality and getting the nature of reality wrong. There is one, only one solution. And it's not faith in God or Buddha. It's not ethics. It's not compassion or loving kindness. Those are all great, but they are not enough to counteract ignorance and delusion. And the only antidote for the ignorance and delusion that lies at the root of suffering is knowledge, insight, knowing reality as it is. There's no substitute. If ignorance and delusion are the problem, you have to counteract that with the opposite. And that's what the third and culminating training is. As Shantideva says in his wisdom chapter, in his presentation of the, of the way of life of the Bodhisattva, he said, all that precedes it, the teachings on generosity, of ethics, of patience, of enthusiasm, teachings on meditation, the first five of the six perfections, all of these are for the sake of one thing. All of these are for the sake of the cultivation of wisdom. It is wisdom that frees. It is the truth that shall make you free. This is not just a Buddhist truth. It is just a true truth. Call it religious if you like, or maybe why don't you just throw out the adjectives? 
it actually actually is true. Truth will make you free, and not anything less won't. And so that's the highest. This is a Buddhist truth, the highest joy in the Buddhist, teach, in the Buddhist practice framework is the joy of knowing reality as itself. Let's see how the Buddha articulates this. But this we find in Christianity, in Hinduism, and so forth, and in Socrates and in Aristotle. The highest truth is knowing reality, fully using our human intelligence and maxing it out so that intelligence becomes wisdom and wisdom becomes the perfection of wisdom. And so we see in the next bullet, bullet, bullet point here, the Buddha speaks of the, the cessation of perception. Perception is actually better translated as recognition, so I'll probably fix that. But it's one of the five skandhas, the five psychophysical, the very cessation of the ordinary mind's function of recollection and of feeling pleasure, pain, and indifference. This is that other kind of pleasure or joy or happiness loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure, and the previous pleasure is the pleasure of samadhi. That's really something, that pleasure of samadhi. That's the, the symptom of extraordinary, finely tuned and balanced and robust mind. But better than that is the transcendence of your own mind. And he's referring, to, he's referring to that critical faculty or skanda of recognition, faculty of your mind. The faculty of mind of feeling, pleasure, pain, and indifference, that's a faculty. Transcending that, there you will find the highest, the most sublime, happiness. And since this, and now paraphrase, but you can see where this is in the Pali Canon, since this is the culmination of a long list of pleasures, probably the ones we just looked at, each in turn superior to the preceding one, the implication is that this is the highest. There's a lot more, and if you study the Pali Canon, there are many ways the Buddha approached this. But the transcendence of feeling, the transcendence, the going beyond, like going supersonic, going beyond, transcending the feelings of the human mind and transcending that brings you into a domain of reality that we call nirvana. And the bliss of nirvana, the bliss of freedom, the bliss of knowing the ultimate nature of reality is the highest and most sustainable bliss. And it's all for the sake of that. And so, this is genuine well-being in the, Buddha, in the Buddhist tra tradition and the Buddha, and I'm quoting the Pali Canon here the basis of Theravada Buddhism, and it's really fundamental to all schools of Buddhism. But in the same Pali Canon, the Buddha says, and this is a paraphrase, find out what really constitutes true well-being and based on this understanding. Pursue it. Pursue it. It's a very deep paraphrase. 2,500 years before Joseph Campbell's Follow Your Bliss. That could be very trivial. He was not a trivial man, so I think he's referring to something meaningful. It's not following your hedonia. You'll never find satisfaction there, and never anything sustainable. The older you get, the more obvious that becomes. Right? My father's 95, and it was maybe 10 years ago. He said, from now on, everything just gets worse. <laughs> and it did. My mother died. They were married for almost 70 years. She was his first date when he was 15. And I don't think he ever dated anybody else. He found the woman he wanted, and that was it. Her parents said, date somebody else. She tried it once. I don't care for it. Let's go back to him. Almost 70 years. So when you lose a, a life partner of 70 years, well, that's not your best day. He misses her every day. And it was a good marriage. Very deeply in love, their whole life. But it doesn't end well, because now he just misses her every single day. He loved to travel, no, no more travel. He won't even come up to Santa Barbara, it's too far. You know, it's tough being old. That's old, I'm getting old. But I look at him, I'm not there yet. As young people, yes you are. <laughs> but no, I'm not there yet. So there it is, samsara. The joys of samsara are just not sustainable. We're just facing aging and sickness and death. And then all of your hedonic, ple hedonic pleasure just evaporates. So find out what really constitutes genuine well-being and then cultivate that, cultivate that, that. And so 
we have until 3.30, I think, yes, 3.30, and then we'll take our break. I wanted to introduce, just to introduce some terminology now, got it covered, and then I'll use that terminology for the rest of this retreat. It's not a, a, not a lot, and I'll be looking at these Sanskrit terms only because we don't have them in English. And generally, we don't, have, don't have, have anything close. So let's look at the first one, Dharma. If we could translate Dharma, heck, I would do it. But spiritual practice, not quite. Spirituality, too vague. Religion, no. Not equivalent to religion. We don't have the word for Dharma. We just don't have it as in practicing dharma, devoting yourself to dharma, taking refuge in dharma. We don't have a word for that. It's not theology, it's not doctrine, it's not teaching, it's not, no, it's not that. So what is dharma? And when I traveled to India when I was 71 and was received just a feast of dharma, six days a week from a wonderful geshe, Tibetan Lama, Geshe Ngamantai Ge, just a feast, and we're hearing dharma every single day. Every single day we're hearing about Dharma. And then after about maybe a year, it dawned on me, what is exactly does that word mean? You know, because the translator was saying Dharma. He wasn't trying to find some kind of more or less similar word in English. He'd say Dharma. Uh, so I asked Gishin, I'm going to tell you, what, it, what, what is Dharma? And he didn't look at me like I was a knucklehead. He said, well, Dharma, and I'm paraphrasing him. This is a long time ago. But I'm paraphrasing, I'm sure, in the spirit of what he said. He said, well, Dharma is a way of viewing reality, a way of engaging with reality that gives rise to a sustainable sense of well-being. Let's just paraphrase that. Dharma is a way of viewing reality, a way of living, that gives rise to eudaimonia. And that means it's certainly not confined to Buddha. Buddhism, Buddha in Sanskrit, what we call Buddhism is called Buddha Dharma, the Dharma taught by the Buddha. But all of my love, Tibetan Lama say, of course, that's not the only kind of dharma. What are you thinking? There's Christian dharma, there's Hindu dharma, there's Taoist, there's Muslim, there's Jewish. There's dharma outside of religion, there's dharma in science. I mean, you can find it if you know where to look. But that's what dharma is. It's a way of viewing reality, engaging with reality, leading one's life, practicing. That oh, as month goes by, years go by, and in the bigger picture, lifetime and lifetime go by. You are exploring, you're discovering a deeper and deeper, more and more sustainable sense of genuine well-being of all three kinds, flowing out of ethics, flowing out of samadhi, flowing out of wisdom. And that's dharma. We don't have a word like that. But we do in Sanskrit, and that's why we keep it untranslated. Bhavana. Well, that we can translate. We translate it universally, pretty much, as the Sanskrit. All of these are Sanskrit. Yep, all Sanskrit. Uh, bhavana, we translate it as meditation. Meditation, but it doesn't have the same connotation. Meditation in the Krishna tradition is a, bit, a little bit different from contemplation. Um, and it's one of those things, some people, you've heard some people are really into meditation. I've heard of them, they're really into meditation. But after a while, some of them get bored and then they get into surfing instead. Because it's so much more fun. You know, surfing and, and meditation, you gotta, you know, just get real. Surfing's a lot more fun. You know? So you get into it and then you gotta, I, I practice. I, people say, I, I, practiced Dharma, I practiced meditation for a while, but then I kind of got too busy. But I was really into it, but then I kind of got bored. And then I learned about ayahuasca, and that was much more interesting. <laughs> or anything. Or I got a new girlfriend, and now I'm just so happy I got my girlfriend. <laughs> I didn't have one. I had meditation, but I got a girlfriend, and it's so much more fun. <laughs> you know, so meditation is kind of like a specialty, like people, you know, like in, something kind of weird, esoteric. Oh, I heard he's into meditation. Right? That's just not the connotation of bhavana at all, something esoteric, for, something for spiritual people, something for mystical people. It has, doesn't have any of that connotation. Bhavana is ordinary. Bhavana means to cultivate. And cultivate what? Your mind. Bhavana is cultivating your mind. All of education, getting a degree in mechanical engineering and art history, in technology, in science, in business. You're cultivating your mind, you're cultivating skills, you're cultivating critical thinking, you're cultivating memory, you're cultivating all kinds, you're cultivating your mind. What is education for? If not cultivating your mind, all of education. So education, somebody says, I was kind of into education, but I then, then thought was alcohol was better. <laughs> I guess you really never knew what education was about, you know. And so if we think of what we call meditation, and I'll continue to call it that, it's a cultivation of your mind. It's cultivating your attention skills. 
It's cultivating discerning mindfulness. It's cultivating empathy and a good heart, kindness and loving kindness. Cultivating your memory skills, your imagination. If you're not cultivating your mind, why on earth are you a human being? Haven't you missed the whole point? Why do you have that brain? Why do you have that much intelligence if you're not even going to cultivate it? So, meditation is cultivation, cultivating the mind in meaningful ways, cultivating in the mind in ways that will give rise to genuine well-being. That's bhavana. And so we should start practicing bhavana when we're about three years old and never stop and practice it every day. Because every day that you skip bhavana, is a day that wasn't really as meaningful as it could have been, and maybe it was pointless altogether. You're not cultivating your mind. What are you doing that's more important than that? And not just sitting in your room and mindfully breathing, but you're cultivating your mind in order to bring that mind out into the world and be of greater service and greater service and greater service. A person who goes for medical training six years, seven, eight years of specialization is cultivating his or her mind to cultivate the skills to be able to heal those physically or mentally who are ill and suffering. And after of six or eight, nine years of being useless to society, guess what's a medical student good for? Not even a good parent or spouse. I mean, they're so busy getting their medical training. Six or eight years are pretty much useless, right? But then they come out, and then we can thank them. Thank you so much for being useless for six years. Because now if I get sick, you can help me. Whereas halfway through, you couldn't. Probably be illegal for you to try. So likewise, a person who goes into six, eight-year meditation retreat, we should be all applauding them. You're going in there for the sake of us? You're going into a six or eight-year meditation retreat, full-time practice, eight, 10, 12 hours a day, in order to cultivate greater compassion, greater wisdom, greater samadhi? That's what you're doing, and you're doing this for us so that when you come out, you'll be a far greater benefit not only helping people with hedonia, which is what business people and medical doctors and most educators do, but you're going to come out and help us cultivate eudaimonia because you'll know what you're talking about, because you've plumbed the depths. And when you come out, you will speak with authority, and you will speak with depth, and we will know by being with you, oh my goodness, you have something to offer, and I want to listen to you. That's bhavana. That's bhavana. So it's a good word. I love bhavana. Samadhi, I can be very brief. Samadhi, sam means totally, a means really, and di means to place. You're totally, really placing your mind. It means unification. It means composure, collectedness. It's the opposite of being scatterbrained, discombobulated, multitasking, falling apart. It's getting your act together from the inside out. So that if you're cooking bread, you are absolutely in samadhi on cooking bread. If you're taking care of your children, you're in samadhi on taking care of your children. If you're having a conversation, you're in samadhi on that person. You're giving that person your whole attention. And in your work and your creativity and so forth, you're just totally there. I've, I've heard of different studies have l looked into a very simple question. Day-to-day -day people with no mental training, how much of their time, while they're doing one thing, is their mind caught up in rumination about something utterly unrelated? And I've heard something like 75% of the time. That they're not totally giving their attention to anything. Because they're kind of doing this, but they're thinking about that. So they're not totally into the rumination. They're not totally into what's happening right here and now. It's just kind of half-assed, half-breaked, half-baked, getting by. We should be able to do better than that. And samadhi is the key to learn how to cultivate relaxation, stability, and vividness of attention. That's what we're here for. Samadhi. On the highest levels, it can be utterly sublime. Marga. No, no, shamatha, shamatha, shamatha. OK, shamatha is a range of methods, techniques. We'll explore three. And we'll pretty well do them justice in terms of sheer instruction, sowing the seeds that if you're inspired, then you'll practice them for the rest of your life. Hmm. Shamatha literally means Quiescence, tranquility, serenity, peace in Sanskrit. The, t the Tibetan Shi Ne, due to my, one of my revered and beloved mentors, Jeffrey Hopkins, one of the pioneers in modern academic study of, of Tibetan Buddhism, he translated it's called Mamayading, and it really stuck. It, and it's not wrong, it he's such a good scholar. Of course it's right. 
calm abiding, but doesn't really tell you much calm abiding. Shi, nei, shi means peaceful, serene, and nei also means just stillness. It's serene stillness. That speaks to me more. He's right. But it's serene, it's tranquil, it's quiescent, it's calm, calm stillness. Not because you're holding your mind like that, because you're releasing your awareness like that. And calm stillness is the cream that comes to the surface of the milk. Shamatha is a ray of methods designed to develop your faculties of mindfulness, of introspection, of attention, of samadhi. And as we'll see, and I won't elaborate now, there is such a thing as achieving shamatha. And we'll look into that, and you'll know precisely what that means. According to the finest gold standards we have in multiple schools of Buddhism, it's a very fine state of samadhi, in which the mind becomes marvelously and unprecedentedly serviceable, buoyant, malleable. And what was the term you gave me? You gave me another one. Pliant. Pliant. No, there's another one. Pliant, yes. Or maybe it was somebody else that gave it. But, but in, you got the message. Buoyant, light, malleable, supple. There was another word that somebody, I think it was uh, Dvorah that told me. But it's, the mind is serviceable. You can do it. It's like, like a well-trained, superb gymnast. And you ask him, do this, and, the, and the, he does it. And like, wow, do, do this. And they can do it. Wow, you've got a body. That body, boy, your body works. Your body is tuned. Having a mind like that, having a mind like the body of a world-class gymnast, that you tell, the, the, you tell your mind, jump, and your mind says, how far? rather than you tell your mind, jump, and the mind tells you, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> so one phrase I really like a lot in the classic shamatha literature is, when you achieve shamatha, you now have a mind. Until then, the mind had you, baby. It's, the image I like is a little five-year-old girl, 60-pound five-year-old girl, taking a 150-pound Great Dane for a walk. When the cat comes along, who's taking who for a walk? Okay. Who's, who's taking, are you taking your mind for a walk, or is the mind taking you for a wild ride? And sometimes just beating the crap out of you. You don't have a mind if you can't even control it. It's like saying you own a wild elephant, yeah? Does the elephant know that? And so, that's shamatha, and then marga, oh, one of the most important terms of all of Buddhism, I and mean, we can translate it, but the translation hardly hints at the depth of the meaning of this simple term, which we accurately translate as path. Path. The fourth noble truth, the whole, all of the three first noble truths, the, the reality of suffering, the reality of the cause of suffering, the reality of freedom, the cessation of suffering, all of that is leading to, pointing to the grand finale of these four realities, and that is the reality of the path, marga. But path is not a poetic term. It's not vague. It's very precise. Marga, when you've entered the path to liberation, you've entered the path to perfect awakening of a Buddha. This means you've come to a point in your spiritual practice, your spiritual evolution, your spiritual maturation, if you come to a point that you've matured so far and so deeply that you'll never fall back. Not just in this lifetime, in all future lifetimes. In a way, I think that's more important than achieving enlightenment itself. Achieving Buddhahood, it seems a little bit distant but achieving the path, and what does that mean? What, does, what needs to happen in order to enter the path such that from now on you'll never fall back? You enter the path of a bodhisattva, you are a bodhisattva. And now, once you've stabilized in that path of the bodhisattva in the rest of your life, but more importantly, all future lifetime, you'll never be anything less. You'll always be a bodhisattva every single lifetime until you're a Buddha. You've got a, a pass all the way through to enlightenment. You'll always be a bodhisattva. You'll never fall back into a meaningless existence, a wandering lounge like a blind rat in a sewer, looking for some little niblet of crap that you can eat in the great ocean of suffering. You've actually found a path that doesn't go around and around, but goes to liberation, goes to freedom, goes to awakening. Path. What does it take? 
to reach the path. You know, we'll look into that. But you see, it's got gravitas. It's not just practicing Dharma. It's reaching the path. And that is why this historical figure of Gautama, who had a lovely wife and a healthy baby boy and a loving father and success tracks just laid out before him like a red carpet. He was the crown prince. And he had a maid. And he turned his back on all of that and left and became a wandering mendicant with nothing more than the clothes on his back and a begging bowl. Why did he leave? He could have practiced Dharma at home. He could have been a very good father and a very good spouse and a very good prince and a very good king and he could have been a very righteous king. And he could have practiced Dharma as a king, a father and a husband. He could have. But he didn't leave home to practice Dharma. He didn't make that sacrifice for himself and everybody who loved him, who missed him unbearably. He didn't make that sacrifice so he could go off and practice Dharma or that he could achieve samadhi or practice shamatha. He had to leave to find the path. He found the path. He followed the path to its culmination. It took him six years. Good investment of time. Become a medical doctor or become Buddha? Six years, if you are well prepared. And then he came back, and the blessing he brought to his own family, his community, and people throughout all of Asia for 2,500 years and now worldwide, the blessings continue to flow because he did make that sacrifice for six years and found the path and then spent the rest of his life showing the path to liberation to everyone who wanted to listen. That's path. That has transformed civilization upon civilization. Dharma's everywhere. Everywhere, Buddha Dharma went, there was always some kind of Dharma. Hardly anybody's just sheer savages living like animals. Most people have some Dharma. But he brought path. And people have been reaching the path, achieving liberation, achieving his enlightenment since him. Had he not taken off six years, he would have been a really good dad and a fine king. And who would ever remember him? So that's Dharma. And then finally, yoga. Not referring to asanas and exercises and so forth. Yoga is a, is a heavy, it's a gravitas term in Sanskrit. It comes from the Sanskrit verbal root yuj, which means to join, to unite. And in Sanskrit, and, but the Tibetan is even sweeter. You can see it, you can't even pronounce it, but it's pronounced nanjor. You'd never guess it unless you know Tibetan. Nanjor, nanjor, that's the it's Tibetan version of yoga. And now means your natural state when you're not caught up and carried away, configured by this, that. You're not identifying with a man, being a man or a woman or an Australian or a Kiwi. You're not identifying with your social class. You're just not identifying with anything that you are not. And then you settle and you come to discover who you are. And you, jor means to unite. It's yoga. It's huge. But you're uniting with who you've always been. You're uniting, uniting with your ground. And that's yoga. So that's why most people don't translate yoga either. So now I just wanted to show you the basis that I was interpreting when I taught the first settling of body, speech, and mind in the natural states. So I, I just added this to the notes recently because I thought, well, did I just make that up? Is that something that Alan Wallace dreamed up? Nope. I was taught this especially by my primary Dzogchen Lama, and that is the Venerable Gyatru Rinpoche, with whom I've been training for 29 years now. It's been my primary focus of practice. Mah Mahamudra and Dzogchen has really been the focus of my, my practice, writings, teachings, practice, practice, for 29 years. And he was really opened the floodgates for that. And one of the texts that he taught, for which I, I interpreted for him and translated the text, and his oral commentary published in a book called Natural Liberation. In this, Padmasambhava, the great 8th century Dzogchen master from India who taught in Tibet and elsewhere, in this text, then Padmasambhava refers to this initial settling as the foundation for all of the meditative practice he'll ever do. And it starts with settling the body in its natural state. And he says, now you see exactly what he said in English translation, that I was interpreting when I taught you how to settle body, speech, and mind. Body in its natural state, he says, if you do not know how to place your body in a good posture, the genuine meditative state, and he's referring to shamatha, I know this by context, if you don't know how to settle your body in its natural state, shamatha won't arise. 
genuine meditative state. By contact, we know he's referring to shamatha. Shamatha will not arise. You need to settle your body. You need to balance your body. Relax, stable, and clear in order that it can be provided the support for achieving shamatha. Now, this reliance of the, the mind on the body is common knowledge in Buddhism. It is a fundamental and tragic error, catastrophic error, I'm afraid, to equate the mind with simply a function of the body, some activities and neurons. There's no evidence for it. And it's unfortunately not only wrong, but catastrophically wrong. But it is true that if you don't take care of your body, your mind will not function as well, because your mind, from moment to moment, day to day, the activities of your mind arise independence upon the body. And if you allow your body to deteriorate in terms of your health, or should you have brain damage, or you take drugs or alcohol, then the basis is now, how do you say, damaged, and the mind that arises independence upon, but does not emerge from the brain, will be damaged. And that's what the Gautama found after his six years of austerities. He was experimenting. He was experimenting. He left home, highly educated, knowing what he passionately knew he needed to do, not knowing how to do it. He found two masters of samadhi, just flat out straight samadhi, going into profound states of deep meditative concentration. He was a prodigy. He achieved their states extremely rapidly, invited by them to teach, and he saw that that was not the path. Nothing irreversible had taken place. And he knew that, and his teachers didn't know that. But he was, he was Gautama. And so he, he left that. He said, no, this isn't it. If that's as good as it, if that's the best you've got, this is not what I'm seeking. To be able to go such into a deep state of samadhi that you're completely disengaged from this world, going into esoteric, sublime, extremely subtle dimensions of reality where you've just left all of this world behind. And this peace that surpasses understanding, inexpressible peace and stillness, that feels like it could go on forever, and thinking this is it. This is, this is what I always long for. Ultimate, lasting, enduring, Peace of mind, better than being happy. Peace of mind. And Gautama realized that. He experienced it very rapidly. And then he came out of his meditation. Well, that was nice. But as my mind fundamentally shifted, that was a nice excursion. But here I am, and this is not path. So for the next almost six years, then he devoted himself. He was a scientist. He experimented with the methods that were available, yoga, breathing exercises, fasting. He really ran the course. He tried this and that, my mastery of, of mind over your body and so forth. And he basically ruined his health. He became so emaciated that he said when he went to touch his belly button, he touched his backbone. He, was, he wiped himself out. Really, he probably could have just starved to death until happily he encountered a young woman uh, who just encouraged me, I've got, I have some yogurt here and some rice. You look like you really need it. I said, okay. Because he could hardly meditate anymore. He was so weak, so emaciated, that his mind that is arising upon the body was arising independence upon a very damaged body. He couldn't meditate very well. So he said, well, thank you. And he broke his austerities. He, he suspended them. This isn't working either. Now I know both extremes. I know the extreme of luxury, of hedonic <laughs> extravaganza. And now I know this extreme of just too intense. It's self-torture. This isn't going anywhere either. That doesn't go anywhere. That goes around and around. This just goes down and down until I die. Because I've killed myself with my own asceticism. That can't be the way. That can't be the path. If you want to know the path, you want to know the middle way, find the extremes, and what's left over is the middle way. He did, in spades. Prince to pauper. Emaciated, almost on the verge of death, pauper. That's, he found it. He pushed it any further. He probably would have died. But he got his health back. And then he was ready to find the middle way and really very rapidly did find the path and came to the culmination of the path. And so the genuine meditative state, shamatha, really does depend on taking good care of your body. Nutrition, exercise, right posture, that's not to be overlooked. Often, too often in Tibetan tradition, 
good diet and exercise gets to be kind of marginalized or overlooked entirely. And that doesn't turn out well. It turns out with overweight, hypertension, diabetes, sometimes stroke. Mm, not, so, not so attending to this statement here. So take good care of your body so that it's a good vessel so you can use it and your mind that arises in dependence upon it will be fit and healthy. So shamatha won't arise if, you're, if you've not settled your body in its natural state or even if you do enter into some meditative state that is of a great value, it will run into problems. It will be unsustainable. Unsustainable, you have to get a little peek, a peekaboo into it and then you'll be out. So the posture is important. With the body straight and erect, the channels, these are the nadis or channels of prana, are straight. The cha- when, the, when, the channels, when the channels are straight, with the channels straight, the vital energies, the prana are straight. With the vital energies remaining straight, awareness settles in its natural state. We'll see that actually refers finally to shamatha. And the meditative circ- state occurs naturally. You'll hear shamatha, you'll just flow right into it. Meditate firmly and unwaveringly in the appropriate posture without any bodily movement at all. That is because the meditative state must arise once the body is settled in its natural state. So the body is no way overlooked. You really, and it often is, but not if you're following Padmasambhava. So that's the body, and then you saw me, I had oral transmission on this, oral commentary, so then I elaborated, interpreted the way you know. And then we have settling the speech in its natural state. Padmasambhava in the same text said, settle your speech naturally in silence like a st- lute with its strings cut, effortless and silence. But another, now this time 19th century Dzogchen master, Leda Blingba, in a book that I translated called Open Mind, he said then, related to settling your speech in its natural state, then, having settled your body in its natural state, then ease the movements of your respiration so that they are imperceptible, thereby settling your speech in its natural state. So highlighting the profound connection between verbal speech and mental speech and your respiration. It's a very strong correlation. We can see this when we're really upset. Watch, look at your respiration. When you're really tense, maybe you're working on some plan that's really stressing you out, if you can, just check to see what's happened to your respiration. You're probably screwing with it, impeding it, blocking it. You're probably preventing your body from breathing in a healthy way. And whenever we contract with anxiety, with anger, with impatience, with goal-driven me, 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 or with craving, I want, I want, I want, I hope, I fear, I hope, I hope, oh, I am fear, we get caught in the grip of an emotion, grip of ambition, grip of ego, You're going to watch that has a real damaging effect on your respiration, and that will damage your your whole nervous system, and welcome to being chronically stressed out and thinking it's normal because you can still function and get your work done. So he's talking about here is stress prevention, afflictive stress prevention, of learning how to let your body breathe and don't get in the way. The body is much better breathing than you are. And so... So the movements, this is very, I just changed the translation with one verb. In an earlier translation that was published, I said, then slow the movements of respiration, but that's not quite correct. I looked at it again, I looked at the Tibetan and said, no, he didn't say slow. The term is flopa. The the synonym is flopa means relax, ease, loosen up. In terms of the movements, your lungs, your abdomen, the body breathing, just Surrender to the respiration. Don't pump it. Don't keep it going. Don't do it. (sighs) Release all effort. Release the rumination. Just ease, ease, and ease. Soothe. Be a hoarse whisperer to your breath. And soothe it. Calm it. And I can tell you what will happen. Why not? You want a sneak preview? I've done this. 49 years, I got a little taste of it. And that is, you'll find when you begin, probably a lot of fairly deep breathing, if you really allow the, bo- the, the body to get the oxygen it needs, it's probably going to ask for a lot. So you may find very, when you really allow the breath, to, you may very well find a lot of deep breathing. And then sometimes short, and then long, 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 and maybe a short, short, and then sometimes erratic breathing, sometimes like that, and then, and then, and then sometimes you breathe out and you wait for 20 or 30 seconds before the next breath happens to float in. 
So you might find a lot of unevenness and sometimes long, and then as you keep on settling and settling and settling, allowing the body to settle by way of the breathing, sooner or later, you're probably going to come to a point where the breathing then, it might be quite quick shift from long, 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 or long, erratic, erratic, long, to suddenly then going into a flow that's quite shallow, shallow, short breaths, but they stay short. We'll get that later, but they stay short, shallow breathing, shallow breathing. And then as you keep on going deeper and deeper, the frequency of the breath will probably stay the same. It doesn't get shorter and shorter, you start to hyperventilate, but short. But as you go deeper and deeper, the amplitude of the breath, the volume of air you're taking in, gets less and less because your body needs less and less. You aren't, burn many, you aren't burning many calories when you're in deep meditation. And so the amplitude of it goes less and less and less. And when he says imperceptible, I think what he's referring to before deep, deep zesu samadhi is the breath is so shallow and rhythmic, you can't hear yourself breathing. It's not that you don't know whether you're breathing or not. That's very deep samadhi. Mm. But then... When you're in that flow, it's flow, it's chikstemihaya, flow from psychology. It's a flow where the breathing is just subtle and it's homogenous. And you can't hear it. And you can hardly feel it. And it just goes subtler and subtler. That's settling in your respiration in its natural state. But don't try to go for the quick fix and take over the manual control of your breath and say, okay, subtle you said? How subtle? How short? I'll do it. I'll do that right now. Nope, that's not the way it works. The body has to do it, and it has to work out all the chinks, all the imbalances in the process of getting there. The path is the path. That's just what comes out of the path, but you can't skip the path and say, oh, I'll just do that. It doesn't work that way. <coughs> and then we have the, the deepest one. Sadly, the mind is natural state. Direct, again, a direct quote from Padmasambhava. Natural liberation is settling the mind in its natural state. There are, there are three parts, outer, inner, and subtle, or outer, inner, and secret. In so, first of all, while keeping the body and speech as they were before, and that's settled in their natural state, let your mind be lucid, clear, lucid, bright, transparent, without engaging with any thoughts concerning earlier or later deceptive appearances of the three times, that his thoughts will continue to arise. Of course they will, don't worry about it. But when these thoughts pertaining to the past, the future, or even thoughts about the present moment, when they arise, he says, don't engage with them, don't identify with them, don't think them. This is subtle, but it's definitely doable, I'll guarantee that. You can observe thoughts without thinking them. It takes a bit of practice, and then more practice. But you can simply see thoughts coming up, like seeing bubbles come up in an aquarium. They're just coming up, but that's not my bubble. I'm not bubbling that one. I'm not thinking that's not my bubble. You're just seeing bubbles come up, or seeing my like birds fly, or seeing clouds form in the sky. It's not my cloud. There's the cloud. Oh, it vanished. It's really like that, you know, with rapidly changing weather patterns, just seeing clouds form in the dissolve. And you're resting in the stillness of awareness and simply witnessing the coming and goings of thoughts. But you're not engaging with you. You're not going to the referent of the thought. You're not thinking the thought. Your attention is simply the seeing the thought as thought, viewing it from the stillness of awareness. That's settling the mind is naturally. It's a method, it's a process. He's not, he's not referring to the end result here. He's referring to method. Just observing thoughts without thinking them. That's outwardly. Inwardly, settle the mind evenly without engaging in any good thoughts. Good thoughts are great, but you don't have to think them all the time. Just let good thoughts arise, but don't think them, don't cultivate them. On occasion, just give it a rest without engaging in any good thoughts such as deity meditation, stage regeneration, for example. That's it. Don't activate your mind and identify with the activations of the mind. Don't visualize. Don't engage in discursive meditation. Don't engage in analytical meditation. They all have a place, but you might try, what's it like not to do that once in a while? and just let your mind settle. 
without doing any mental activities of practice. Prayer, devotion, visualization, mantra, and so forth. Nothing wrong with those. Very valuable. But what about taking a break once in a while and seeing what it's like to settle your mind in its natural state inwardly and then secretly, most privately, innermost. Settle the mind in its natural state by just letting it be. Letting it be just as it is. Steadily, clearly, and lucidly. In the space in front of you, you just let your awareness rest coming out of your head, if you think you're inside your head, stop that. Let your awareness come out in the space in front of you. Lucidity in the space in front of you, in the mind's own mode of existence, letting awareness just rest in awareness without bringing to mind any of the mentally engaging thoughts of the view and meditation which entail mental grasping. In other words, just... It's like having a cage full of doves, like on the top of an apartment building, and then you just open up the top of the cage, and all the doves will say, oh, thank you. <laughs> or having a very frisky dog on a leash, and finally you get to the park, where they say, here, you can have the dog off the leash. And finally, the dog knows what's coming, your pup knows what's coming, and you take it off the leash, and <laughs> that dog's gone running around, falling, leaking for other dogs to play with. You've just let, the mind, let your dog off the leash, right? Let your mind off the leash. Open the cage, just let your mind fly away. Thoughts, images, memories, just And rest in what remains when you kiss your mind goodbye. And you may just discover that you didn't pass out. Because your mind and awareness are not the same thing. That's kind of crucial. You'll discover that if you practice. So that's it. Now you know what I was, there's more to it than that. I, I couldn't, I, it was just too much to copy all of it here. I thought it'd be a bit overwhelming. But that's the basis. Now you know what I was interpreting. So I'm giving you a lot of notes here, a lot of outline. There's this one and then, well, you see, I think something like 30 pages. And so I'm giving you all of this. Um, I've been putting these notes together for something like probably 30 years by now. I've taught shamatha I don't know how many times. I love it every single time because uh, I'm practicing. And so I never leave the same retreat, never give the same teaching. I'm practicing, and every time it's fresh. That's actually true. Um, hmm, where is it going with that? Can't remember. So that's the foundation, that's the ground. And keep on coming back to those three. It's very easy to think, I've got it, I know it. And then when I'm teaching less and less, see, I, I already understand that. As if a conceptual understanding is a good substitute for actually doing the practice. Do the practice, but keep on discovering. As one student of mine, when I was leading an eight-week week several years back in Thailand, I taught this right at the beginning, I always do. And seven weeks into an eight-week retreat, he came back then, I could give interviews once a week. Nowadays, it's every fortnight because we have twice as many people. But back then, once a week, and he came to me after seven weeks of an eight-week retreat, and he said, Alan, I've just discovered what it means to settle my breathing in its natural state, and it's really nice. And he's not stupid. It's easy to understand conceptually, but you're right there on the front lines to really observe your breathing so closely and not control it. We're control freaks. We control. If we attend to something, we try to control it for, you know, for some end that we have in mind. So that's the, the basis. Oh, yes, that's, I know what I was thinking. So I gave you a lot of notes, lots and lots of notes. For anybody who knows Buddhism, you know, I didn't just go eeny, meeny, miny, moe. I like this one, I like, like this one, like a kid going into a candy shop. No, this is not just what I like. Anybody who knows Buddhism, you'll know that for Mahayana, for Dzogchen, for Theravada, for Pali Canon, it's a gold standard all the way through. If you know Buddhism, you'll know that what I've chosen here is absolutely gold standard, start to finish. I'm interpreting, yes, but you know exactly what I'm interpreting. And so when I'm teaching shamatha, I'll be making many statements that are contrary to what you'll hear nowadays in kind of popularized Buddhism. People want to popularize, they, it's fine. If they want to water down, they're fine. If they want to give false marketing and cause advertisement and make false claims about themselves, well, they can do that. I'm not going to try to stop them. But when you look at these notes, if you know Buddhism, you know that these notes are gold standard. And not just Alan Walters' favorite, it had nothing to do with that. But I am enough of a scholar, I know where to find the gold standard, and I have received teachings 
from some of the finest yogis and scholars alive. And that has been my privilege. And that's an objective statement. It's not my lama, it's good, therefore because he's my lama, he's a great lama. No, that's not true. It's, it's something true, independent of me. And so I'd like you to know during this retreat and then when you go home, that this is what you bring home. And by the time you go home, I hope that every page, every line of these notes, and as a lot of them will be clear, that that's my job. That you'll hear me interpret and then you will know, are my interpretation kind of wacky and crazy and making up my own stuff? You can check. You can check for yourself whether following these teachings are eff efficacious. One week is not too short a time. You will have some sense at the end of a week whether these practices are really helpful. They're transparent. And if you find them helpful, then wouldn't you be inspired to continue and do more? And so I'll say right now, coming to a close here, that I do have an aspiration. I did come here with, I want something better. Not for me, really, because I'm very happy to stay at home and meditate. I have a meditation cabin, a little meditation cabin right above my house where my wife and I live, and it's, it's just completely adequate and it has a great view. And so I have everything I need already. But I did hear something better. I like something better for you. And to serve my lamas and serve sentient beings who have been so kind to me. And so what I aspire, my aspiration for this retreat is that when you all leave, you'll have a very clear understanding of every aspect of these teachings. They're not always that self-evident, but that's my job to authentically interpret this in accordance with the lineage that goes back a thousand years, two thousand years, twenty six hundred years. That's my job. If I don't do that, I should stop talking, stop teaching. That you'll go away with a clarity of understanding, a confidence that understanding is sound, and that will be up also to your ex your, inter your exchanges with with um, Eva. You'll have time to clear out un uncertainties. I have a lot of confidence she will be able to help you with that. I'll, I'll give her an introduction to her after the break. But you'll come away with a clear understanding of the theory and the practice. You'll have done enough practice that you'll have a clear understanding of how to do each method that I teach. And we have a variety here. But you'll know how to do the practices. You'll have some taste of when you practice, what are the kind of things that come up in the first week. And so that, and I'll summarize, that when you leave here, you will leave with confidence. I came for a one-week retreat. I participated in the whole retreat. I now clearly understand the teachings around shamatha. I understand the methods of shamatha. I practice them. I have practiced them. I practice them correctly. And I know I practice them correctly. And I'm confident that when I go home, my understanding is sound. My practices of these methods is sound. And if I wish to practice, I know how to do so. And I, on top of that, I'd be delighted if you are, in fact, inspired to do so. And if that's what you come away with, for me, that's better. That's something more, okay? That's my aspiration. So I'm gonna do my best to help you have that clarity, that confidence, that taste, so you know what these are all about. And then if you'd like to feel gratitude at the end, of, if you feel grateful, feel grateful to all of them, because I'm the messenger, that's it. You wanna feel grateful, that's, that's fine, but I'm just, I'm the pizza man. <laughs> but if you wanna be grateful, you don't say, pizza man, you did in a delivery guy. Man, the pizza was fantastic. You're talking to the wrong guy. The pizza parlor is over that, you know. So go back to the pizza parlor. Go back to the Buddha. Go back to Shantideva. Go back to a Sangha, Buddha Gosa. But go back to Lerab Lingba and Padmasambhava. Go back to Tsongkhapa. If you want to express your gratitude, if you feel gratitude, thank them. Because I'm just passing on the goods and trying to practice them in the process. So we'll just tiptoe into the main practices. And we'll start with shamatha without a sign, with a sign. Sign here is a technical term, nimitta in Sanskrit. Sign is a referent, a target. There's a vector of your attention. You're pointing, at, pointing your attention at something. That's called the sign, technical term. It just means the object that you're attending, focusing your attention on. It's got a vector, a focus, direction of your attention. And so in this practice, you're attending to Sensations of breathing in different ways that we'll explore. So we'll see at the, towards the end of this retreat, shamatha without a sign. Can you cultivate and even achieve shamatha without directing your attention here or there by letting your awareness just stay home and not look at anything? Just you're already aware of being aware, aren't you, right now? Don't you know perfectly well that you're aware? You didn't have to try, you didn't start when I said it, right? So all of you are already aware of being aware. Unless you're sleeping, and I don't see anybody sleeping. 
then you're not aware of being aware, but in the waking state. So take that which you already are experiencing, the awareness of being aware, and then just don't do anything else. Single-pointedly withdraw from everything else and single-pointedly go right into the very essence of what it is to be conscious and fathom the nature of consciousness. There's no reason it should be a mystery. Scientifically nowadays, oh, consciousness is a mystery. It's like almost like, like a true, oh, consciousness is one of the final mysteries that science has not solved. Such a mystery, such a mystery. And I want to say, what have you been looking at for the last hundred years? You've been looking at the brain. Why do you think you're going to figure out consciousness by looking at neurons? Really, what gave you that crazy idea? And you've been interviewing people about consciousness? Is that how you study stars, by interviewing people who've looked at the sky? And you're watching people's behavior, and you think you can figure out consciousness by observing behavior? What are you thinking? Every other branch of science, if you want to understand something, you look at it. If you want to, look at, if you want to understand consciousness, why don't you do what all the other scientists do in every single field of science? If you want to understand the nature of consciousness, why don't you just focus on consciousness and do it like five or 10,000 hours? But, oh, by the way, develop your attention skills, otherwise you're going to be wandering around in circles the whole time. So develop your attention skills, develop mindfulness, introspection, achieve shamatha would be a really good idea, and then take that finely honed, tuned, focused attention, and then plunge it right into the depths of awareness itself and see what you see. And by the way, this has been done for hundreds and hundreds of years in Buddhism, and if you ask any knowledgeable Buddhist, is consciousness a mystery? Yeah, for you. But why do you assume that because it's a mystery for science that nobody knows, where did you come up with that pomposity? If the West doesn't know, nobody else. If Europeans don't know, Asians don't know. If scientists don't know, nobody knows. Really, isn't that kind of, have you not noticed that's an idiotic, bigoted, racist, ethnocentric, absurd notion that if we don't know, nobody knows? Oh, by the way, that's commonplace. So maybe it's really time to grow up to the 21st century. I, when I'm speaking to secular audiences, I like to say that, you know, astronomers are wondering, might there be intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? You know, Carl Sagan and so forth. Might there be in the vastness of the universe intelligent life somewhere else beyond our scope? And my answer is yes. It's in a faraway place called Asia. Really, do you think the Chinese, the Indians, the Tibetans, the Mongolians, the South, do you really think they've been sitting on their hands for the last 5,000 years? And by the way, they weren't interested so much in observing whether planets go around in circles or ellipses. That's not what they're interested in. Buddhism, above all, the central focus of interest from the get-go, time of the Buddha, the great monastic universities that preceded by centuries, Oxford, Cambridge, Sorbonne, the University of Bologna, and so forth, by centuries, by millennium, we're in India. Taxila, Nalanda, Vikramashila, the list goes on and on. They had come and gone before European universities even began. Might they not have come up with something when the central focus of their attention was the mind? Because they already knew it is the mind is the place to look if you want to know what are the two sources of suffering and the two sources of happiness. And that's all that we most importantly care about. And so if you want to be happy in a sustainable way, if you want to be free of suffering from a sustainable way, don't look outside into a world you can hardly control in any meaningful way. Look inside where there's a possibility of training your mind and fathoming the nature of mind, the very nature of consciousness, the very origins of your mind, knowing what happens at death and not just having beliefs. And the belief that consciousness terminates at death is as much a belief as any re religious belief you could ever point a stick at. Because the notion that consciousness terminates at death is, has no element of science in it at all. There's nothing scientific about that view. Because scientists simply do not understand, have no idea where consciousness, how it originates, what are the cause, they do not know, and they acknowledge that. And if you don't know how something starts, you don't know how it ends or if it ends. So the stakes are very deep here, very high. And so, confidence. We are alive right now. We have intelligence. We have some leisure. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. We have opportunity, the opportunity of learning Dharma and practicing Dharma. We have the opportunity in this lifetime to actually figure out what's going on. 
Animals don't, they're not bright enough. And a lot of people who are impoverished and so forth don't have the leisure. And many people don't have the opportunity. But we do. We have the leisure and opportunity to actually fathom what is the nature of the mind, its origins, what happens at death. So we, we're prepared when we get there to know how to transmute death into the most sublime and meaningful experience you've ever had in your life. That it's the grand finale of your life and not the loss of everything you cherish. This is an opportunity like a wish-fulfilling jewel in the palm of the hand. And we have that right now. And shamatha is a key, not sufficient but indispensable. So I'll end on one quote and we'll leave, leave the rest. I hope, hope you won't hold you, in, hold you in suspense, but don't hold your breath. Just from the Dhammapada, this anthology of wise sayings of the Buddha, chapter 3, verse 33 to 34, the wise one straightens the fluttering, unsteady mind, which is difficult to guard and hard to restrain, just as a fletcher straights, straightens an arrow shaft like a fish that's been taken out of its watery abode and thrown onto dry land, this mind flutters and trembles when it is removed from the abode of Mara. And what he just said is when you go into retreat and you've removed yourself from all the hedonic pleasures, your mind just starts to freak out. <laughs> Let me out of here. Why did I ever think this was a good idea? This is boring. I can't take it anymore. This was supposed to be fun, and this isn't fun at all. That was the root text. Eva's going to give you the commentary. Because <laughs> she'd just come out of two and a half fruity, and she's, she's, like a, she's like one of those whales. She goes down for, what, five minutes, a half an hour? And then she comes up for a breath of air, and then she's gone again. So look at her closely when she's here. She's going to be gone soon, right back into her, not watery abode, but her little mm, rustic cabin at 8,500 feet in Colorado. You're going right back in. So get her while she's hot. Because <laughs> she's going to cool off really quickly when she goes back to midwinter in Colorado. Man, you freeze your, freeze your socks off. <laughs> so let's take a break. I think we're coming back. We have a nice long break now. Come back with her. I will come back just to introduce her, and then I'm going to exit stage left. Get out of here so we can focus on her. She has a lot to offer. But we come back at 4 o'clock. Is that correct? Okie dokie, nice leisurely break. I'll see you at four o'clock briefly and then I will vanish and she will stay. <laughs>